um, baby from age zero to uh, all the way to the age of 10 years old. I want you to repeat after me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. have your way in my life. I give you freedom to move in this service. I need your gifts and your anointing in my life. Help me to minister to someone this week. Give me understanding as I read your word this week. Holy Spirit, open my mind, open my heart, and open my soul to hear the word of God today. Amen. As you know, um, I've been asking uh, and sharing our goal for Facebook on likes. Um, we've been, we started off uh, in the summer probably around the 700 range, and my goal was to hit 1,000 by the end of summer. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to announce that as of right now, we have 1,006 likes as of today, this morning. Somebody praise the Lord for that. And that helps us to... Um, to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you haven't done it already, just go in on, on, your, on your phone and, and, and check in that you're at New Life Pilsen on Facebook. And then also share the service. It's live right now. It, it's being uh, shared throughout the nation and throughout the world right now. So go ahead and just hit share because that really helps us to reach a lot more people. There are a lot of hurting people. Yesterday we had an awesome prayer service yesterday with a lot of prayer requests that people are watching us online and, and they are hurting. And, and so they've been sending in their prayer requests. And so know that you guys have been sharing it. It's been really reaching out and uh, meeting the needs of people. So that really helps us out a lot. So if you haven't done it, go ahead and do that real quickly and then get off. Amen. Don't, don't worry about what Jose and Maria and all them are doing right now. You can find out after services that they went out and ate a cheeseburger or whatever in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to welcome all those that are watching online right now. God bless you. And if you're ever in the Chicagoland area, make sure you come out to New Life Pilsen where you can uh, hear a powerful word and uh, hear a, a worship that's going to just move your spirit and also meet some of the most lovingest people here in the city of Chicago. And for those of you watching around the nation and around the world, welcome to New Life Pilsen Church here in Chicago. And New Life, give them a warm welcome this afternoon. Today I'm going to continue our series on social media, and I'm going to be talking about Twitter. Everyone say Twitter. Twitter. And we're going to look at that social media site, Twitter. And if you don't know what Twitter is, uh, let me share a little bit of what it is. Twitter is an online social networking service that enables users to send and read short 140-character messages called tweets. And how many of you guys know what a tweet is? It's not like a little bird going tweet, tweet. It's... You know, for some of you, if you think that's what it is, you are old school. Amen. It's, you know, it's, a, it's part of when you send out your message, it's called a tweet. I tweeted somebody. And then if you like that message, it's called, you can retweet it. So um, that's kind of out there. And some of you guys maybe have no clue what that is. But I'm going to share a little bit about that. And I'm going to give you some stats. Everyone say stats. About Twitter. 87% of Americans have heard of Twitter. Compared to Facebook's 88%. But check this out. So it's real close with Facebook. 87% of people in America have heard of Twitter. And 88% of people have heard of Facebook. But only 7%. Everyone say 7. 7% 7 of Americans use Twitter. Compared to Facebook's 41%. 41% of America uses Facebook. But only 7% use Twitter. And there's some reasons behind that. And I'll share with that as we're going through this uh, service and, and this sermon, why only 7% are using Twitter. Twitter is strong on brands. 49% of monthly Twitter users follow a brand or, or, or companies compared to just 16% of social network users overall. So check that out. 49% of people who are on Twitter follow some kind of brand or some kind of company and only 16% of all the other social networks combined follow a brand or a company. Check this out. 
42% learn about products and services via Twitter. 42% of people I learn about a product or a service on Twitter. And 41% provide opinions about products and services. There's 41% of people who are following these brands and, and, and services are providing a comment of what they think about it on Twitter. Now, check this out. 63% of Twitter users access it by their mobile phone. So 63% of the people who actually use Twitter use it through their mobile phone, compared to only 34% of other social networking sites that use just their phone. The other ones might use a, a, a tablet, a computer, or another way of using it. 73% of Twitter users send multiple text messages a day. So if you're on Twitter, you're probably a texter, amen. You're probably sending out a whole bunch of texts if you're also on Twitter. Now, listen to this one. 53% of Twitter users never post any updates. 53% of people who are actually on Twitter, you know, some of you guys who just signed up just because you wanted to sign up because it was a cool thing to do, but 53% of you never actually even sent out a tweet. There's like no tweeting, you know, no tweety birds, no nothing from you guys. 53% of you who are on Twitter never even send up an update. Now listen to this. There are 1.3 billion Twitter accounts in the world. 1.3 billion. That's a billion with a B. 1.3 billion Twitter accounts in the world today, but only 310 million monthly active users. So 1.3 billion people have Twitter, but only 310 million people actually use it. Now follow me. 79%. Check this one out. This one blew my mind, and, and, and it's going to get all into the reasons why as I share with you um, what God revealed to me about this. 79% of Twitter accounts are outside of the United States of America. 79% of people of that 1.3 billion are outside of the United States of America. Why is that? Let me share something. This is what the Lord put into my spirit. The reason why, because Twitter is a word-based social app. And here in America, there is no words inside of us. We're going to go deep. We're going to go deep here. Because we have no word inside of us, we're not able to produce and use an app that has to be totally based on words. Now follow me, follow me. We're, we're going to go deep in this. We are an image-driven society. We want the images to be placed in front of us. We don't want to be able to have to write words to produce images. We want the images to produce the words for us because here in America, we have become lazy and we have become an image-driven society. We're not word-driven society anymore. A lot of us, we don't even like to read books. We say, I'd rather go see the movie. Amen. Because the movie, why? Because it has the images ready there for us. Somebody took those words that the author put on paper, and in their mind, they produced an image. So they made it easy for us. It's like babies. We're being spoon-fed images. And whatever images society wants to give you is the images that you're seeing. And then it turns into the images that you're believing. Why? Because you see it on TV. You see it in Hollywood. You see it in the movie. So if they show you enough images and you have no word inside of you, you believe the images are truth. Now follow me. We're, we're, that's just, we're, we're just starting here. We have nothing of value to say here in America. We have nothing of value to say because we are not word-based. And because we don't have nothing of value to say, we don't write anything on Twitter. Because if you don't say anything cool on Twitter, nobody's going to listen to you or follow you. You can put on Facebook, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm eating a cheeseburger and everybody likes it. You put that on, on Twitter, nobody cares. Because it's a different mentality. It's a different base. It's a different app. Nobody cares about what cheeseburger and what french fry and what, um, you know, place you're at right now on Twitter. They want to hear something of value. They want to hear something that's going to produce something inside their life, that's going to enhance their life. 79% of Twitter accounts are outside of the United States. 
208 followers is the average for Twitter. So the average Twitter account has 208 followers. But 391 million accounts have zero followers. Ain't got nobody following you. <laughs> nobody cares what you got to say. Check this out. Katy Perry has the most followers on Twitter. Can you even guess? What, what do you guys think? How many people? Katy Perry. Five million? No. A lot higher. 20 million higher. You're getting closer. You're very hot. You're super hot. Uh, now you're kind of getting a little cold. <laughs> 87 million right there. Ding, 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 ding. We got a winner here. 87 million. Let me, let me get YouTube. Uh, knock YouTube over. Katy Perry has the most followers on Twitter with 87 million followers. 87 million people are hearing what this woman has to say. <laughs> we won't go into that. Amen. But check this out. Check this out. This is a knowledge base app who has some people who have something to say. 83% of the world's leaders, 83% of the world's leaders are on Twitter. 83% of the world's leaders are on Twitter. They're not on Facebook. They're not out there Snapchatting. They're on Twitter. Why? Because Twitter is a knowledge base, word base app. People who have education, people who understand the values of words, they want to hear what are the world leaders saying. So if you're a world leader, 83% of them are on Twitter. Now, that's just the stats. Now we're going to get into some word. See, people will only listen to someone who has something of value to say. You're only going to listen to people who have something of value to say. If they have no value, you're not going to want to hear them, whether on Twitter or whether live. You, don't, you only hear someone who speaks who produces value to your life. Who's, you can get those words that they're saying, and it produces something of purpose and value inside of you that you can use. Americans have nothing to say because we have lost the value of words. We've lost the value of words. Words are not powerful to us anymore. Words don't produce images for us no more. Our society has moved from the word-driven society to an image-driven society. How do we know that? Because we rather watch a movie than read the book. People can sit. Now, check this out. People can sit in a movie theater for two hours and watch images, but can't hear someone speak for a half hour. Amen. Amen. You're like, Pastor, I'm, I'm timing you right now. You're, you're getting there right now. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm going to produce a long sermon today. Just three hours. Don't worry. <laughs> but you know, if you were going to a movie, you say three hours. Oh, yeah, I'm getting my money's worth. But here at church, you know, 20 minutes, Pastor. 20 minutes. Uh, you know, that's, that's all I can take. Why? Because, and not... Not this church, though. Amen. Other people in other churches, they can't handle word because the word, now they have to produce an image in their mind. As I'm speaking these words, these words have to produce images in your mind. So you have to work. And what we here in American society, we don't want to work. All we want to do is sit down on a sofa, sit down on a movie seat and vegetate and have it all fed to us so our mind can just vegetate and, and check out. And that's when society begins to brainwash the American society because now you are not, you don't have your guard up. You're just relaxing and they're putting in all kinds of stuff. And that's why all this craziness in this world is happening right now is because we have fallen asleep because we have no words. See, my job as a speaker is to use words that create images in the minds of the hearer. I got to use words, so I got to take time. I don't just, just put a sermon together in five minutes and say, this is what I got. Anybody who's good at something takes time. If you're a cook, how many cooks we have here? Um, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm seeing who can cook here because I'm going to go visit you. <laughs> I got to test it, you know, just to make sure. 
But you know, anyone who is a good cook knows that you don't produce good food in, in five minutes. It takes some time. You got to, you know, put that stuff together, whatever ingredients and all that goodness and, you know, all your secret stuff that, you know, your grandma taught you and you can't share with nobody. And, you know, good cooks, you never see them, you know, measuring exactly. They, they just, you know, they just get it by hand because they know. They can feel it. They, they, they can just sense it. And, and it takes time. You know, it always takes time to make some good food. That's why you go at McDonald's, you're going to get McDonald's food. You know, if you wait more than two minutes, you know, that's too long at McDonald's. But if you go and get another hamburger, you know, from David Burke's or, you know, some nice fancy restaurant, it's going to take a little more time than at McDonald's. But the burger that you're going to receive, even though it's still a burger, it's taking more time for this burger, and this burger is worth the wait. I know, believe me, I, I know, I've been to a lot of burger places. I know the good burgers. This doesn't lie right here. This tells the truth. It takes time. It takes time to produce something good. So as I prepare this message, I go over it over and over and over and over. And I change things in because I want to create images in your mind as I'm preaching. I, I, don't, I don't just take five minutes. I don't just take one hour. I just don't take one day. I go in and work on it and work on it and work on it so I can give you the best that God has given me so I can produce words that are of value to you that will produce images in your mind. Twitter, for the most part, is not for drama. It's not for the latest gossip. It's not for who you're mad at today. Amen. Because we know, all of us know on Facebook, you put them, them, them coded messages. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. How many times, you know, you're mad at somebody, but you never, make, you never mention their name, but you put that coded message that everybody and their mama knows who you're talking about. Amen. Y'all look at your neighbor and say, that's you. <laughs> Y'all know you've done it because I've seen it. I've seen it on your Facebook accounts. Y'all putting them coded messages, and I know you're talking about somebody. I might not know the person you're talking about, but I know you're talking about a specific individual when you're talking about that stuff. Doesn't it make you mad when people, you know, you put like that, when people act funny or when people, and you know, you just went and, and, and you're, you're nearing it down to, it ain't people, it's one person that you're mad at. Come on. <laughs> y'all, y'all think, y'all think we don't realize that? See that Facebook? We know, we know them coded messages. Twitter ain't for that. You ain't gonna see that on Twitter. That's that fifty-three percent that don't, that have that account but never use it. They're out because they're using Facebook putting coded messages. Amen. Facebook ain't for. I mean, Twitter ain't for that. Twitter is for learning. Twitter's for understanding. Twitter's for growing in knowledge about life or products. You saw the statistics. People learn about products and services on Twitter. They're, they're hearing something. They want to know. They don't want gossip. They want gossip. They go to Snapchat. They go to Facebook. You get the gossip. You get the drama there. But on Twitter, they, they want to learn. They want to learn about something, whether a service or a product. That's what statistics is telling us. That's what the world is saying. The world, those are the statistics from the, from, from the Internet, from, from the world. They're telling us this is what Twitter is for. It's a higher-level social media site for people with education or understanding of powerful words. Because you have to say what you want in only 140 letters. And it has to be something that someone wants to hear. You know how hard it is to say something of value in 140 characters, 140 letters? You have to really think about what you have to say. Because you, you know on Facebook, people write books sometimes on that thing. Oh, yeah. they, you got to, you know, hit the more. And then you think it's just going to be a line or two. And it's like a whole book. It's like a, a scroll. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, she really mad at her husband today. <laughs> but Twitter... You only got 140 characters to say what you got to say. You got to say it, and you got to say it quickly. Check it out. Let's look at someone in the Bible now who would have had a lot of followers if they had a Twitter account because they knew how to use words and catchy lines to make people think, 
They were able to, their words were powerful and it produced great images in the minds of people. Now, as I was praying, God, who would that person be? And the Lord said, you know what? Paul. Everyone say Paul. Paul. What if Paul the apostle had a Twitter account? And in order to understand Paul, we got to understand a little history about Paul. First, let's look at his history. Paul was born in Tarsus. Everyone say Tarsus. Around 10 AD. His parents were Jewish Pharisees, but they were also Roman citizens. Now check this out. Most Jews were not Roman citizens. Only those, check this out, only those who made a great contribution to the Roman Empire were made citizens. They were Jewish, but they were also Roman citizens. And you, How do you know that? Because you see in the Bible all the time Paul saying, I'm a Roman citizen. Every time he got in trouble and he needed to talk to somebody of importance, he says, hey, you can't treat me like that. You can't treat me just like a Jew because I'm also a Roman citizen. I got rights. And how did he get those rights and how did he become a Roman citizen? It's because his parents, his parents made a great contribution to the Roman Empire and they were made citizens. Because they had great influence, and they also had money. His parents had money. But here's the question I want to ask you, those of you who are parents here today, whether a mother or a father, what are you giving your children beyond money? Because money runs out. You, you can save $100,000, and when you pass away, give it to your children, and your children could spend it all in one day, and the money could be gone. So what are you giving your children beyond money? Look what Paul's parents gave him. They gave him great influence because they were influential people. They knew how to use words, and they gave him something that was of value and that he could use. And they trained him very well. Now listen to this. At 14, Paul was sent to a man named Gamaliel. To become a rabbi. But rabbis also at that time had to learn another trade so they wouldn't be a burden on people. And so at the same time Paul was learning to become a rabbi, he was in rabbi school, he was also in a trade school. How do we know that? Because you saw it in the Bible. If you read it, you find out he's a tent maker as well. He knew, he, he knew how to make tents. So his parents told him, you're not only going to be educated and you're not only going to have this strong and, and, and great education because we, we believe in that, we're also going to train you in a skill. So if anything ever happens where your education can't get uh, finances for you, you're going to have a skill that you can fall back on and it's called tent making. So you're going to go to the trade school of tent making, and you're going to learn how to make tents. So you always have a stream and avenue of income. You see, you always got to have other streams. Don't just have one stream of income coming into your home, because if that stream dries up, what else can you fall back on? So you need to make sure that your children are not only educated, but they also know how to do some other things that, that they just not just educated in in education, but they have some skills that they can use. So that's what Paul's did. And he was educated by one of the most respected and educated rabbi at the time. Because his his parents had money, they were able to afford that. They sent him to the best rabbi, the most educated rabbi at the time. Paul was taught how to use words to bring up imagery in people's mind as he spoke. When they taught him to become a rabbi, they, they said, Paul, you, you, this is how you're going to have to do it. They, they went over with him how to speak, how to speak in front of people, how to use imagery and words to bring up these images in people's minds. Even though Paul wasn't saved until later in life, check this out. God allowed him to be trained and educated by the best. He wasn't saved yet. He didn't know Jesus Christ. But, you see, God had a plan for his life. God knew the future. See, God knows the future of each and every one of you. And some of you get some training. Some of you got a job that's training you in some great things. And the reason why you're getting all this training and the reason why you're getting all this knowledge, because God says in the future, I got a plan for you that I'm going to use that knowledge that you're receiving on your job to bless the people of God. 
See, some of you are blessed financially right now, not for yourself, but so that God has allowed finances to come to you so that you can invest in the kingdom of God to get things done. So Paul was being trained by the best, not knowing that in the future God was going to use that training. Paul had an encounter with Jesus one day. And he became a follower of Jesus. And and all that stuff you can read on your own. And because of his education and because of his training, God used him in a mighty way to speak to kings, to speak to city leaders. You see, you're not going to get in front of a king and a city leader talking ghetto. Amen, Amen, young people. You're not going to get in front of the governor the mayor of the city of Chicago. When I meet with the mayor, I ain't going up to him, yo, what's up, dog, man? And I got my pants hanging down and my chony showing. I can't meet with the mayor looking like that and talking like that. He's going to he gonna escort me. This, this, this fool is crazy. I got to be educated. I got to know how to use my words when I get in front of kings, when I get in front of a city leader. I got to have an education. I got to know what I'm saying. My words have to be powerful. See, Paul was trained, remember, and educated by the best because God was going to use him to put him in front of Caesar, to put him in front of the leaders of Rome, to put him in front of the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. He was going to be speaking to high educated people, and he couldn't be talking like ghetto. He had to know how to talk. He had to know how to communicate. He had to know how to articulate his words so that people understood what he was saying and said, okay, this is a man, I might not agree with him, but at least I can hear him out because he knows what he's saying. God also has given new life, that same anointing to speak to leaders of this city so that we can meet the needs of our community. That's how we're able to do these events like Pastor Peter was talking about our back-to-school event, and all these other events because we found favor. Why? Because we got people in our ministry that know how to talk to people in leadership, that know how to talk to senators and, and, and represented, House of Representatives and, and, and city leaders to get finances and, and, and to get favor and to get uh, permits and everything that we need to do the great things that we do is because why God has given us that anointing through the education of our people. So young people, never doubt your education. If you're hanging around with people telling you, um, hey, dog, you don't need no education. Man, street life, man. Street life will educate you. Man, you need to get you a new circle. Because all they're going to talk to is other thugs. Because that's all who's going to understand, you know, what you're talking about. You got to get around people who are educated, people who are going to take you far, people who are in corporations. Get around those kinds of people that are going to bring you up. Because then God can use you to do great things. That's why our mission here, our vision here at New Life is to love God, love people, meet the need. But in order to do that, we got to know how to talk. we got to know how to use words. And Paul's words carry great weight. And because of his education, God used him to write most of the New Testament. You know, in the Bible, that New Testament, the, the, the last half of the, of the Bible there, that part of that Bible, most of it was written by one man. Paul. And how did God use him? Because of the training he received back in the day when he didn't even know God. All that training when he was at 14 years old that his parents sent him and said, you're going to get educated, son. See, my, my, in, my, in my house, my children have no choice. It ain't like, uh, I, you know, do I have to go to school? No, you ain't got no choice. There's no option. There's school and that's it. You got to go to school. You got to go to college. There's no option in my house. Payment? Hey. I serve a God that, that is Jehovah Jireh. He'll find a way that I can get you into college. I'm never going to use money as an excuse as a parent that says, why my children aren't going to get educated. So parents, you, you don't make it an option. Oh, mijito, you don't want to go to school today. Okay, you stay with mommy and, and we'll walk and go shopping. No, don't do that to your children. You tell them, unless they're throwing up, dying, and their limb fell off, they're going to school. They ain't staying at home. They ain't getting no education at home. They ain't learning in front of the TV by SpongeBob. Man, 
YouTube keeps falling over. I'm going to just leave them right here because I keep knocking YouTube for some reason. Me and YouTube are not getting along today. You can't leave them at home. You send them to school. Don't, don't be, oh, I'm too tired to wake up today, kids. You sleep. No, no, no. Get up. Get up. Get your kids ready. Make them a breakfast. Send them to school. Get educated because you don't know how God is going to use that education in their lives in the future. You got to teach them. You got to teach them. My parents taught me, man, to be early. That's why when you see me, I'm always early. Wherever I come, if I say 5 o'clock and I get there at 4.50, I'm late. Amen. Amen. We got to get that mentality here at church. Amen. Some of us. Nobody here, I know. We all come early. Amen. I know. <laughs> Not in this church. Even, even as Susie lives upstairs, you know. Amen. He, he says, when he comes late, he says it's the traffic on the stairs coming down that's keeping him from getting here on time. But that's a whole nother story, a whole nother sermon. Amen. <laughs> His parents are probably going to be listening to this message. Amen. We have to. You have to be strong with your kids. Make them go to school. Get them educated. Give them the best education. If they have dreams to go to certain colleges, don't tell them, oh, baby, that's too expensive. We, we never can afford that. We're, you know, we're from the hood of Chicago. Man, it doesn't matter where you're from. You serve God, Jehovah Jireh, who can provide. If they want to go to Harvard, then God will find a way. If you work hard, God will get them to Harvard. You don't get, kill their dream. Wherever they want to go, you say, baby, we're going to find a way. Whether I got to go on the corner and sell waters or whatever the case may be, you're going to get to that school that your heart desires because my children are going to be educated. They're going to know how to use words. Now, let's look at some of the great tweets that Paul would have sent out if he had Twitter. Paul would have had a lot of followers, I believe. I, I believe he would have more than Katy Perry, amen, if he had a Twitter account because his words produce great images in the minds of the hearers. You know, for instance, just to give you an example of how words can produce images real fast. I can say the word dog. And I bet you most of you already came up with a picture of a dog. Some of you have your own dog, so you picture your little chihuahua, your little, you know, cocker spaniel. You know, you're seeing that little dog jumping around. You, you already see that picture. But all of you have Different pictures are probably of dogs in your mind right now. Some of you got Rottweilers. Some of you men, you know, you got pit bulls, you know. You want, you know, because you, you don't see too many guys with chihuahuas. I mean, not, not too many. But uh, most of the guys are probably picturing Rottweilers and German Shepherds and pit bulls for the most part. Unless you have a little dog, you know, and then you're picturing your little doggy. But if I were to begin to explain, you know, a certain dog and certain characteristics, then I can get you all on the same page and get you picturing the same type of dog. And what it's up to is up to the speaker, how he uses his words to produce images in your mind. Now let's look at one of Paul's tweets. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. This would be one of his tweets I believe he would send. And I believe this would be retweeted a lot. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Everyone say gain. Now, this tweet by Paul would make you think, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because it's going to make you use your mind. This is deep right here. Just even on the surface is deep. But it's like an iceberg. You know, an iceberg, the, you only see about 2% of the whole iceberg, what you see on the top. Some of you just read that, and you're just seeing just 2% of what's really in there. 98% of it, you're going to have to go deep under the water to figure this thing out, what he's really trying to tell us here. But he's producing imagery in your mind. Now, the word me, and where it says to me, for me, the word me brings up a picture of yourself. When I hear the word me, in my mind, I'm picturing myself. And my question is to you is, as you're picturing yourself, those of you, as you say the word me, and you're picturing your own self in your mind, what makes you, you? What makes you unique? What makes you different? Because we were all created as a unique, different being. 
We're not all created to be the same. God didn't create, you know, even though it would have been great if he did, you know, God didn't create a million Roberts, Pastor Robs. He didn't do that. Even though the world would run so much smoother, you know, we wouldn't have so many problems, man. This, this church would be flowing perfect, man. No, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. It would be flowing almost perfect. <laughs> We're all created unique. God made each and every one of you different. You all have differences in you. You all have different personalities. Each and every one of you have a different personality. Some of you are very quiet. Some of you are very mean. Not here, though. Other people. Some are very outspoken. Some are very loud. Some, you know, just... We all got different personalities. Some people, you can say all you want, they'll never get mad at you. Some person, you just look at them, you know, just out of the corner of your eye, and they're ready to fight. They're like, all right, let's go. We all got different personalities because God made us unique. God didn't want, you know, a cookie cutter where everybody was the same. The world would be so boring if everybody was the same. Everybody's unique, and we have to learn how to work with the uniqueness that God made in us, and and each and every one of us here at this church, we got to realize, okay, they're different than me. They think different than me. They were brought up different than me. So just because they think that way doesn't mean I'm going to condemn them, but I'm going to learn why they think the way they think, and so that we can come to an understanding, so that we can work together, so that we can live in koinia and peace and unity and be together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're all unique. God made us like that. Paul's saying, I don't know about you, when he says, for me. What he's really saying here is, dig deeper, I don't know about you, but for me, this is where I stand. When he says, as for me, he's telling you, this is where I stand. And just like Joshua, Joshua, if you know Joshua in the Old Testament, he says, I don't know about you, but as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care about what you think, but I know my children, my son Nehemiah, my son, my daughter Elise, they're going to grow up in the ways of the Lord. They don't have a choice to come to church. They can't tell me, Papi, I don't want to go to church today. You ain't got no choice. You're coming to church because as for my household, we're going to be a godly home. I don't care what so-and-so is doing because, you know, as kids, we said the same thing. But so-and-so gets to do it. So-and-so's parents let them do it. And what did, what did our parents tell us? Oh, we don't care what so-and-so's parents does. You're my kid. They ain't paying the bills. They ain't buying you clothes. They ain't putting food on the table. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So you got to understand who you are and what do you stand for. Because there's a such thing called absolute truth that doesn't change with time or culture. You see, in American society, because we've been image driven now, we don't even believe in absolute truth. You talk to a lot of people, they'll say there is no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is conditional, depending on what you believe. It's true. Just like they'll tell you God, well, if you believe it, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. Why? Because they don't believe in absolute truths. But the Bible sets a standard of absolute truths. There's truth that doesn't change yesterday, today, and forever. That's what God says. I'm the same. This truth will never change. The gospel of salvation message of Jesus Christ will never change. That is the only way into heaven is through Jesus Christ, through no other man. Absolute truth. As for me, you see, it's just not just right on the border. It goes deep. You have to go deep. These Twitters, these tweets, they go deep. This is what Paul was taught, how to use words that are powerful and bring up deep imagery. Now, the word live in that scripture, the word live, go ahead and throw that scripture back up there so we kind of follow it, Philippians 121, to live. Now, the word live in the Greek means both physical and spiritual existence. You know, it's just not your physical existence here on this earth, but it's also a spiritual existence. It means our existence. Check this out. It means our existence is only sustained by God's self-existence. Now, let me unpack that for a second so that you can understand it. My children, Nehemiah and Elise, only exist because I existed. If I didn't exist, Nehemiah wouldn't exist. If I didn't exist, Elise wouldn't exist. So what Paul's saying to live, this is what he says, I exist 
only because God exists. Because I exist, it testifies that there is a God. You want people to understand there is a God? You tell them, look at me. Because I exist tells you there is a God. Because as for me, this is my absolute truth. See, the reason why Nehemiah exists, it testifies that I exist. He couldn't exist by himself. Everybody understands that in the physical. Children don't ex- just pop out of the ground. You've never seen a monkey turn into a child. I've never been into the zoo one day and saw the monkey next day. Oh, I'm sorry, the monkey left. It's a child now. It's never happened. If, if that's what was true, we came from monkeys. Why hasn't a monkey turned into a man over this billions of years that they say this earth is old, you know, monkeys have always been born. So through that process, it should have turned into a man by now. Right. Somebody, some monkey in this world. I've never seen it. Believe me, it would be on CNN Live. They would show the monkey and then they would show the boy and say, look, there it is. But what speaks of truth all the time, nobody ever questions you that there was a father and a mother when they see a child. They say there has to be, because if they exist, somebody else had to exist to bring them into the world. It's the same way with us. We only exist because God exists. And he exists because he's already been self-existent. He doesn't rely on anybody. That's an absolute truth. He's always existed. See, that's so deep, our mind. If you think about it, your mind would just go in circles. How can he exist? Who created God? Nobody created God. He was just God. He existed before time existed. He created time. And because we exist, we're a testimony of God. He exists. So how do you look at life? Do you see it as I am whatever I am because of me? You know, you hear people, I'm just doing me. I'm not hurting nobody. As long as I don't hurt nobody, I can do me. But I'm here to tell you there's more than just you. Your life is connected to destiny. You have destiny in your life. So you can't just act and speak any way you want. Not only do you have destiny in your life, other people's destinies are connected to your life. There are so many people that are connected to your destiny that are relying on you. There's so many people who are connected to me that are relying on my destiny, that I fulfill my destiny so they can fulfill theirs. Imagine if I never started this church. Some of you would have never probably got saved. But because I started this church, now your destiny has been connected to me. You see, you you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you got to be with God following um, God's life. Your life has meaning. You're more than just a physical being. You're also a spiritual being. You're given life through your spiritual being which received his life from God. You see, when Adam received life, God breathed into his nostril life. And he received life. Why did he breathe through the nose? Because the nose is how you smell things. You know, like I talked about earlier, I take some good time to cook some good food. How do you know food is cooking? You smell it. Man, and, and you know, if it smells good, woo, you're like, man, I can't wait till it's done. If it smells horrible, like for me, menudo, I can't stand that smell, man. That, I, I run. When I smell menudo, some of you guys love menudo. I don't. I'm, I'm not a menudo either. I don't, I don't like eating stom- stomachs of cows. That's not me. You know, other people make it different ways. Chitlins and, and menudo, all that same thing. I don't like that. I, I smell it. I'm like, nope, not for me. You know, for Puerto Ricans, bacalao, I'm running. I don't like that smell. It smells horrible. Because your nose, you're, it's fish. It's like this smelly fish that they make. It's just horrible for me. You Puerto Ricans that love it, God bless you. Keep eating it. But if you're making it, don't invite me. Don't get offended because I won't eat it. I, I'll bring my cheeseburger in the pocket. I'll be hiding it. Because I don't eat bacalao and I don't eat menudo. That's just not me. If I smell it, I'm running. Because your nose smells. So why did God breathe in your nose? So that you could smell 
what God is cooking. This morning as we were worshiping, I pray, and I know that some of you smelled in the atmosphere, God was doing something. You could smell it. You're like, oh, man, God is cooking up something good, and I can't wait to eat. That's what your nose begins to smell in your spirit. That's why God breathed in your nose the life so that you could smell life. You could smell death. You could smell what God was doing. Don't, you, don't think you just exist to exist. You have purpose. God put you on this earth at this time for a purpose. You ever think about that? You could have been born in any time, at any place. You could have been born in any country. But here you are right now in the United States of America at this time, 2016, August, what, 28th? 2016, you're walking in this earth right now, not by chance, not by coincidence, but because of purpose. God has a purpose for your life at this time to exist. While on this earth, you have to live for that purpose that Christ has for you. See, don't live for options, but live for purpose. See, there's people who live for options. Well, I could do this or I could do that. See, you can't make your choices in life on options. Options can lead you wrong. You make your choices on purpose. When you live on purpose, you decide, do I do this? Well, is it part of my purpose? Is this what God has called me on this earth to exist for? If it's not part of your purpose, it could be something good. But if it's not part of your purpose, don't get involved. Don't do it. Don't go there. Because if it's not for your purpose, it's going to draw you away from your purpose. And all of you have been called for a purpose. And if you don't know what your purpose is, then you need to see God. God will reveal her. He's the revealer of purposes. So don't use options. Don't weigh your options. Well, I have A or B. No, live your life on purpose. And you'll see what God is going to do. The word die in the Greek, because it says for me to live is Christ and to die. The word die in Greek is made up of two words. That means away, from, and die. Now, the word die literally means moving away from natural life to spiritual life. That's what it means in the Greek. To move away from the natural life to the spiritual life. It also means a separation that comes with a divine closure. So when Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die, that word die means a divine closure. When you die, when you die here on this earth, you're going to move away. You're going to be separated from the natural, and you're going to have a divine closure. For those of you who die in Christ, you're going to live with Christ for all of eternity. Your divine closure is set with Christ. But sadly, for those of you who die outside of Christ, your divine closure is going to be separation from God in hell. That's what die means. There's, there's a closure, a divine closure. Because once you die, that's it. There's no praying for the person once they die. Oh, I'm going to pray them into heaven. No, you're not. They're dead. That's it. Their choice, their, close, their divine closure has been closed. That's it. You got to make your choice while you're alive on this earth. The tweet that Paul says is really giving us a great image. Because so, I win both ways. While I live on this earth, I live for Christ. And if I live for Christ, I lose nothing. What do I lose on this earth if I live for Christ? I lose nothing. I live a good life. Just say, for instance, all this stuff is untrue. If I live for Christ, I just lived a good life. The Bible says be good to others, bless others. What do I lose if I live for Christ on this earth? So I win both ways. And if I die, if it's untrue, then I just die and I rot in the ground, worms eat me. That's it. It's over. But if what God says is true, if I die, then I lose everything if I die outside of Christ. But then I gain everything if I die in Christ. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I know our, our time is going, but I want to share this last tweet. Hopefully I can get through this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 this would be another tweet that I believe Paul would send out. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Go ahead and show that up there. 
Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. I believe that would be a powerful tweet that Paul would put out there. Now check this out. The Greek word for deceived is planeo, where we get the English word planet. And a planet is a wandering body. Now, let's go. We're going to go deep. We're going to go under this iceberg. The word planeno in the Greek, which is evil, I'm, which is, uh, excuse me, deceived, the word planeno means to go astray, to get off course, to deviate from the correct path. Wandering, roaming into error. As I'm saying these things, in my mind, I know I'm getting an image, getting off path. I, I, I see the path right there in my mind, and I'm imagining walking off that path. Why? Because words are creating images. Now follow me. Roaming. You know, it says roaming into error. It means also that, roaming into error. When your phone is on roaming, you know, those of you who got your cell phones, when it goes on roaming, what's happening is that you are not on the right network. When I went to Michigan, I went way up north, I mean, up to the upper peninsula, like right by Canada, in the middle of nowhere. My phone was on roaming. It was looking for its home network. It couldn't find it. It was looking and looking, but it couldn't find its home because this is Sprint. I got Sprint. Um, and it couldn't find its home network. It kept roaming and roaming and roaming. And when you're on roaming, uh, there's certain things on your phone that won't function anymore. If you've ever been on roaming, there's certain things on your phone when you're at home, when it's in the right network, it functions properly. Everything works. You got 4G. You know, over there, I didn't even have 1G. I had like 0G. I had like, a, you know, the old Flintstones with the little parrot sending me emails you young kids don't have no clue what the Flintstones are, but look it up on YouTube. You'll find the Flintstones. I grew up watching Flintstones. When this phone is on roaming, it's trying to find the right path. It's trying to find its home. You see, when you're being deceived, you're roaming. You're trying to find the right path. You're being led astray. There's certain things in your life that won't function right when you're roaming. There's certain things that God can't do in your life when you're not on your home network. When you're not connected to Jesus Christ, you are on the wrong network and your phone won't work. You won't be on 4G. Things won't be happening lightning fast in your life when you're not in your home network. Some of you got to get back home. Some of you got to get back to Jesus. Jesus. Some of you got to get connected to God so you can be in your home network. Don't be deceived. Don't be a wandering. Don't be walking off the right path. When you get off the course, the path that God has for your life won't function right. Now, the word evil, where it says do not be deceived, evil. Go ahead and throw that scripture back up there. The word evil in the Greek means inwardly foul. Check this out. And I'm praying that it's creating images in your mind. Something inwardly foul. That's what evil means. Rotten to the core. It literally means inner malice flowing out of a morally rotten character. When it's rotten, when something is rotten, it's no good. It's no good. As you know, we're, we're fixing the women's bathroom here. We totally gutted it. But guess what? We couldn't tell that we had rotten wood where the women's toilets were. All that wood was rotten. But guess what? It was covered by flooring and tile. See, some of us, we're covering our rottenness by a whole bunch of different stuff in our life. We're trying to cover everything that's rotten inside of us. We're laying flooring and tile on top of it, and we don't know that we're rotten until we start tearing it all apart. I didn't find out that that wood was rotten until we tore everything out. We got all the tile out. We got all the flooring out. And the man calls me in and says, look, the wood is no good. It's rotten to the core. You can't even put a nail in it anymore. It's, it's, it's all soft and gooey. Wood is not supposed to be soft and gooey. 
because it was leaking. The toilets were leaking, and, and it, was, it was just a mess. So you women are going to have an awesome, great bathroom when it's done. You, you're going you're gonna to be in the, you're going to want to just hang out in the bathroom and just use it all day. It's going to be so great in there. But once service starts, get out. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We ain't going to make it that great. So, you know, we'll make the seats a little hard so you can't sit too long. Amen. <laughs> but we got, we got rid of it all. But we didn't know it was rotten until somebody went in there and started tearing things up. You see, you got to allow some people to come into your life and tear some things up inside of you so that they can get deep inside of you to find out if there's some rottenness inside of you, some flowing malice that's coming out of you that you don't even realize why all these words are coming out of your mouth. It's because you're rotten to the core. And you need someone to go in there and extract all that rottenness and pull it out. See, don't, you know, for instance, like an apple. How many of you ever seen a rotten apple? By itself, it stays rotten by itself. But stick it with some good apples, what happens? They all get rotten. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Some people, especially young people, say, oh, it doesn't matter who I hang out with. They don't affect me. You've been lied to, baby girl. You've been lied to, young man. Evil company corrupts good habits. If it works in the physical, if you get a rotten apple and you stick it with good apples, it becomes rotten. What do you think is going to happen to you? If you're a good character, if, if God is using you, but you start hanging out with thugs and drug dealers and, and all this mess that's out there, don't think, well, I can just be good and, and nothing's going to happen to me. It ain't going to affect me. The enemy has deceived you. It's going to destroy your good character. It's going to destroy who you are. You need to look and some of you might need to prune some stuff out of your life get some of that stuff and extract it out that's what the word of God says now the word evil in the Greek means rotten you know and don't think it's just a murderer or someone who's evil but anyone who is off course the Bible says that God has for them is evil See, I was, we, we hear the word evil, and we just got a preconception, you know, a murderer, uh, a rapist. Those are evil people. I'm not. The Bible says if you're off course, you're evil. <laughs> if you're off course, you're evil. <laughs> it will affect you if you stay around evil people who are off course. Because it's not about options. Why? I, I, I'm my own person. I get to choose who I get to hang out with. You see, options are going to destroy you. You got to live on purpose. It's not whether, oh, should I hang out with them or not? Are they going to help me in the purpose that God has for me? If they're going to help me in my purpose, then baby, come on, let's hang out. But if you're not going to help me in my purpose, I got to go. I got things to do. I got places to go. I can't have you destroying my life because I am on purpose, not options. The word company, the word company, because it says, do not be deceived. Go ahead and throw that back. Every time I say those words, throw it back up. I want to I see that. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, check this out. I told you, I, I study deep. I study hard. I go, I go in deep to understand this stuff. The word company in the Greek literally is the word for intercourse. Check this out now. This is imagery now. I know some of you already got imagery right now. Some of you already see it. Check this out. Evil company. Now, that word company means intercourse. Now, when you think of intercourse, you think of closeness. Also, the mixing of fluids happens during intercourse. Guess what? That same thing happens spiritually when you connect yourself to someone evil. Evil company. Think of that. It's like having intercourse. Check this out. I love Kool-Aid. How many of you guys love Kool-Aid? Like the Kool-Aid man? Remember, remember that commercial? Hey, Kool-Aid man. And he would come running through the wall and break through. How many of you guys remember that? Some of you guys are aging. You guys are all about my age. The rest of the kids have no clue. They don't have no clue about the Kool-Aid man. I love Kool-Aid. For those of you who are at my house or in my office to drink my Kool-Aid, no, I love it. I love to make it nice and sweet. 
I, lo- that, I love Kool-Aid. But once you make Kool-Aid, once you make Kool-Aid, you know, you get the, I like to buy the ones already mixed. I don't, I don't like the packets no more. I graduated beyond the packets and mixed the sugar. I like the ones already pre-mixed. Debbie, Debbie hates Kool-Aid. She likes to make all natural stuff. When we're here in AIM, she, 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 she yells at me for bringing Kool-Aid. She said, what's this? She gets lambins and she wants to make naturals. I'm like, forget that. Just give me Kool-Aid quick. I, I need Kool-Aid fix. So once you make Kool-Aid, those of you who have ever made Kool-Aid, know that you pour it in the water, right? Then you get a spoon or something and you mix it. And then once you mix it, you get Kool-Aid. Now after you mix it, you cannot go in there and try to separate the Kool-Aid mix from the water anymore. Why? Because it's already been mixed in. There's no way that you can separate the Kool-Aid mix, the powder, from the water anymore. It's been mixed together. Now follow me. I hope you're getting some imagery here. Good character is corrupted by evil company. Once you mix, remember the word intercourse, evil company. Once you're ready mix with that evil company, the juices and all that stuff that's going in with that evil people once they mix in with you. Guess what, baby? It's hard to get that stuff out. The only way it's going to happen is by a miracle of God that can remove that evilness, that company outside of you, because you need to stop hanging around evil characters. Because once you mix, it's too late. You're going to need a miracle of God to get that mix out of you. Let me wind this thing down here. Worship team, let's get ready here. Now the word corrupt in the Greek means to waste away. The word corrupt says evil company corrupts. Now the word corrupt in the Greek means to waste away. It means to deteriorate. It means, check this out, moving down from a higher level to a lower level. That's what the word corrupt means in the Greek. One day you was up on high with God. And then you got with some people and they brought you down to their level. They corrupted you. You were here and they brought you down. How many of you guys ever come out of a church service and you was way up here. Then you get around some people and they just messed you up. You heard some stuff. They said some stuff. And you're like, bam. Why? Because they corrupted you. You was here with God, and then what did they do? They brought you down. See, some of you got to get away from all that gossip and all that drama. Some of you got to cut some relationships because that's all it is, is drama. If you already know they're going to bring you drama. When when you see their their name on your phone, you're like, okay, it's drama. It's drama. I already know it. I'm going to talk for two hours, and all I'm going to hear is drama. Baby mama drama, and this drama, and that drama, and... You need to delete that number, block that number, and say, hey, baby, I- I'm tired. I-, I have no room for drama. I don't have time for drama. I don't want to be corrupted. You know that old saying that our parents used to tell us, and, 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 and it's based spiritually. Tell me who you hang with, and I what? Tell you who you are. Remember that? That's all biblical. Even if they didn't serve God, biblical truths... Our biblical truths, no matter what, whether you believe or not, as a believer, they're still the same. Now, the word good in the Greek means beneficial. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good. Now, that word good in the Greek means beneficial. It means useful to God. Check that out. Useful to God. If you're corrupted, if you're rotten, you're not useful to God. If you're corrupted, you're not useful to God. Now, the word habits in the Greek means daily lifestyle. It corrupts good habits. It means daily lifestyle. So the question Paul is saying, are you useful to God on a daily basis? Or you're just useful every once in a while? Are you useful on a daily basis to God? Or can God count on you Tuesday and you're corrupted already? 
Because God doesn't need you just on Sunday. Some of you might be just useful on Sunday. I know not here, other places. But are you useful to God on a daily basis? Can he count on you Monday? Can he count on you Saturday night, 11 o'clock at night, someone's in need? Can he call on you and say, I need you to go minister to that person? Or you're like, oh, kind of in the club right now, God. <laughs> are you useful to God on a daily basis? Or have you been corrupted? Are you evil? Remember, evil is just off course. Because if you're off course, you're not useful to God on a daily basis. If you're making choices on good and evil and options, you're, you're useless to God because you're not on purpose. Have you ever played sports? Have you ever played sports? For instance, basketball. And you're not one of the starters. You're on the bench. You're a bench player. But guess what? Bench players are useful. Because in basketball, number one, people can get fouls. And they need to come out. And if the coach calls your name, are you going to be like, well, I'm not ready, coach. I'm not ready to get in the game. Don't call, it, call on so-and-so. Call them. I, I'm not ready. People get hurt. People get ejected. People get tired. And they need to call on you. What good are you on the bench if you're not useful? See, some of you right now, you might be on the church bench right now. Maybe you're not involved in the ministry and you're like, I, I want to get in. But when they call your name, do you always come up with an excuse? Oh, I can't. I can't do that, pastor. That's not me. Well, you were complaining and gossiping on the bench saying they don't use you. And when there's time to use you, you're no good. I got two people that believe that. <laughs> Are you useful to God on a daily basis? Not just when you want. Not just how you want to get it done. Because God has a purpose for you. You got to be ready when your name is called. And you got to get off the bench and get in the game. But if you're around evil, and if you're evil, you're useless to God. Let's all stand up. I wish I had some more time. Got some more tweets. But we, 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 we're where we need to be right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Close your eyes with me. Keep knocking things down, Snapchat. Get back up there, Snap. Jesus. Are you useful to God? <laughs> 